Good morning everyone and welcome to week eight of our online services. And in this lockdown season where we're not able to gather together, it's so encouraging to know that so many are tuning in at this time to these services and worshipping together wherever we are. And it's good to remind ourselves that we can trust God at all times. Jesus is still on the throne and we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Uh, now, one of our church family has a special birthday this week. It's Esther Green. She's 21 on Wednesday. So many happy returns for Wednesday to Esther. Well, I hope, like me, you've been encouraged in recent weeks to see the faces and voices of different members of our church family waving and saying hello. And the good news is that we've more this week. As well as that, we've got a special hello and video from our BMS missionaries, Bethan and Gareth Shrubsoul in Chad. And so we'll see those now. Greetings from sweltering hot Chad. We are Gareth and Beth and Shropsol, and we're serving in Indomina with our children Samuel, Jonah and Eva. We've been here since January after, ser after four months in France learning French in Massy near Paris. Despite sometimes feeling quite removed from the worldwide community, we are not able to avoid the COVID-19 pandemic. So far there have been 23 verified cases in Chad, two of which have been healed. But of course this doesn't tell the whole story. Tests are not widely available, and perhaps many people wouldn't know the symptoms in order to seek a special test anyway, so this is not a complete picture. In order to prepare for this pandemic, Guinea War II hospital staff have been taking temperatures of patients before they come into the hospital, ensuring that everybody is washing their hands <coughs> and uh, also using a health questionnaire to verify people at higher risk, uh, ensuring that suspect cases are sent to another gov a hospital designated by the government. But if that hospital becomes too full, if this really takes off, then we may also end up treating cases here. So we've prepared a potential isolation area. We've been stocking up on bottled oxygen, on masks, on gloves, and uh, all the other things that we might need. The government have been active here. They wisely closed all the schools, the non-essential shops, the hotels with their swimming pools, the churches, the mosques. They've restricted public transport and they've banned gatherings of over 50 people. There's also a night curfew between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. and 5 a.m. So we're really hoping this will limit the spread of this disease. But of course, these things have an economic impact. And here in one of the world's four poorest countries, that could be the real problem. There are so many other health problems here in Chad. And if people can't afford to pay for their health care, then there will be people suffering from these other problems as well as COVID-19. We know that COVID-19 is affecting the entire world. And we're thinking of you suffering in a variety of ways. We pray for you and your loved ones that you can keep safe and remain comforted by the steadfast love of our Lord. We are also praying for world leaders to make wise decisions, both in Chad, in the UK and the wider world. We know that BMS World Mission is helping people affected by COVID-19 in many countries across the world. Here at Guinea War II Hospital, <laughs> we've recently received a £20,000 grant from the COVID-19 Relief Fund, which will be vital for keeping this hospital open and running and treating all sorts of conditions over the next few months. We know that wouldn't be possible without you, so we thank you so much for your generosity, especially at this difficult time for you at home as well. We pray for you every blessing the Lord can give you during this period, but more than that, we pray, pray that you will be a blessing to others, showing that God's unchanging, unfailing love. We pray that it can be seen for you. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, do keep sending those videos through to Tony. It's such an encouragement. And please do pray for Bethan, Gareth, Sam, Jonah and Eva in Chad. And pray for one another as well at this time. Well, as we continue, let's pray and ask God to speak to us in the rest of the service. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are not a silent God who leaves us guessing as we face the puzzles and trials of life. Rather, we thank you that you speak to us through your word. And so we pray now that you might give us open hearts and minds to hear what you have to say to us this morning. 
Show us more of Jesus, we pray. And we ask this for his name's sake. Amen. Everybody. I do hope you've been having a good week. We're living in quite difficult times at the moment. Some of us will be missing friends, family members perhaps we can't see and we don't like being shut in very much. It's easy in difficult times to feel a little bit like this. or even this, which could be even worse. Getting grumpy is not hard for most people, including me. The Bible tells us that we've got to stay thankful. Here's a verse from 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. I'm going to read it, and then why don't we read it all together for a second time. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let's say together, give thanks in all circumstances, 
for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. But how do we actually do that? Here's some things that I find really helpful. First of all, take a plate, an ordinary dinner plate will do. And then think of the best meal you've had this week. Picture it in your mind and give thanks to God who made that available to you. Another thing I find helps me to give thanks is to go to a window, maybe open it and look through, pause and then look carefully. What can you see? There's tremendous variety of things there, aren't there? Look at all God has made and be thankful. Another thing that helps me is to think of people I've been in contact with. This is my mother and she's in a care home where lots of people are taking care of her. It's not easy and we have a chat on the phone most nights and we even do some quizzes together. Why don't you think of somebody that you like speaking to and give thanks for them? Lastly, we all need things to look forward to. So look at a calendar or a diary and think ahead to something that you're really looking forward to doing when lockdown ends. And then give thanks that that may be really possible. For some of you who are good at drawing or painting, you could take these four things and maybe draw a picture or a painting of one or more of them, a plate and what you like having on it, the view outside your window, a person you like talking to, or something that's ahead that you're looking forward to. Draw that and as you do so, be thankful. Good morning everybody. Today's reading is from Hebrews 11. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. By faith Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith he still speaks even though he is dead. By faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For he, before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a, a father because he considered himself faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, as he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised, they only saw them and welcomed them from a distance and they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things shown, uh, show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of a country they had left, they would have the opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. 
By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be ill-treated among the people of God rather than to employ the, enjoy the pleasures of sin uh, for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as a greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left, left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. There, these were all condemned for their faith, yet none of them received what they had been promised. God had planned something better for us, so that not only together with us would they be made perfect. Good morning, everyone. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Father, first of all, we want to praise you and give you thanks that we can actually come before you and call you Father. We praise you for your amazing power and for the work that you have done in our lives. We thank you for your goodness, Lord, for your sustaining love over us, for the many blessings that we receive from you each and every day, and for giving us the hope and assurance of eternal life, even through the toughest of times. You are an awesome God, and we thank you for being the rock, the firm foundation in our lives. We especially thank you, Father, for sending your Son, Jesus, to the world. Thank you that he became the sacrifice for my sin, for our sins, that by his punishment on the cross, we are given freedom from the power of death and are seen as righteous as he is and receive the forgiveness of sins. Father, please forgive us when we don't thank you enough for this, when we don't thank you enough for who you are and for all that you have done and given. Father, we pray for our country at this time and we ask for your blessing over this land. We know that you have blessed us and have protected us as a nation in the past. And we thank you for the freedoms that we have, which have cost so many lives. Father, we also pray for the men and women who serve our country. And we thank you for their public service, especially during these difficult times. We pray for our government, Lord, for those who you have placed in authority over us. We ask, Lord, that you help them and give them wisdom in the difficult decisions that they have to make. Guide them by your spirit, Lord, and help them to leave with honesty and integrity. Strengthen those that are followers in you, Lord Jesus, and help them to stand firm in their faith and influence others so that you are glorified in their public service. We also thank you, Lord, for all those who are working so that our lives are safer and easier at this time. We thank you for our health service in this country and for all those who have put themselves at risk as they attend to the needs of other people. We thank you for their courage and compassion and we ask that you will support and protect them. Give them the strength to deal with each day as it comes and bless them, Father, so that they may be a blessing to others. Lord, we also pray for your church around the world and at home. Help us, Father in heaven, as your children to live out a life of love for each other, helping where we can with care and compassion so that others may see this and be, be drawn to you. Shine your light through us, Lord, and give us the strength to be bold and share with the world that sin and death have been conquered by you, Lord Jesus. Help us to be bold and not to hide this amazing truth or keep it to ourselves. Open doors for us, Lord, as individuals and as a church, so that we can share the hope that we have in you, Help us to share this to all world that sorely needs you as a saviour. Father in heaven, we also want to bring before you today those who are struggling with life's daily challenges, those who we know and love, those that are sick or worried, 
those that are housebound at the moment and are feeling the loneliness of these times. We just ask you, Lord, that you remind them that you call them by name, that you know and love them and hold them in the palm of your hand. We ask, Father in heaven, that you bring them healing and peace. Help them, help us all to grow in the faith that you have given. We thank you, Father, that you give us all hope in these days when we feel, some of us might feel uncertain about the future. And in these times, Father in heaven, please remind us that we who have put our faith in you have a promise of an everlasting future with you in heaven. So, Lord, give us all the strength to deal with each day as it comes, to live with courage through the different challenges that each of us faith, so that your name may be glorified. Thank you, Father in heaven, for your everlasting love, for your love and your grace and your mercy, that we may know all and see your blessings throughout our lives in this week. In Jesus' name we pray for these things. Amen.
Well, please do turn back to Hebrews chapter 11, uh, which was read to us earlier. The scene is the Mexico Olympic Games, 1968. The marathon is the final event on the program, and the Olympic Stadium is packed. And there's excitement as the first athlete and Ethiopian runner enters to complete the race. The crowd erupts as he crosses the finishing line. Meanwhile, back in the field is another runner, John Stephen Aquari from Tanzania. He's been left behind long ago by the other runners because about 12 kilometers from home, Aquari had fallen and badly injured himself. He was bleeding and his knee was dislocated from the joint. He was repeatedly asked to quit the race by officials, but he declined. So with his knee bandaged, he picked himself up and hobbled the remaining 12 kilometers, wincing at every step. At 7 p.m., over an hour after the winner had finished, a quarry entered the stadium. It was almost dark and most of the crowd had gone home. Those left cheered sympathetically as eventually a quarry hobbles across the finishing line and collapses to the ground. Filmmaker Bud Greenspan later asked him, why did you do this? You were in such pain and you couldn't possibly win. Greenspan recalls a quarry's reaction. He looked at me like I was crazy and then said, Mr. Greenspan, I don't think you understand. My country did not send me thousands of miles to start the race. They sent me thousands of miles to finish the race. Keep running the race to the very end. That's the great appeal of this letter, or, or rather this sermon. If you've been with us in recent weeks, you'll know the writer of Hebrews has real people in mind. People he loves very much, and people for whom he's concerned. Concerned that some are beginning to waver under pressure. His great appeal to them is keep going, persevere. It's a key word. We saw it last week, chapter 10, verse 36. You need to persevere. Again, at the beginning of the next chapter, run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Don't shrink back, he says. Live by faith, keep persevering. But what does that persevering faith look like? Well, chapter 10, 12, 11 tells us. It's a message to us. Verse 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Now before we move on, we've got to understand the context here. Hebrews 11 is probably the best known chapter in this letter. If you didn't know anything else about Hebrews before the start of the series, then you probably knew about chapter 11. But we must remember it's written to a particular group of people who are facing the temptation to drift back to Judaism. It's not designed to give us a definition of what faith is. And it doesn't tell us everything we need to know about faith in general. Rather, the writer is saying, keep persevering in faith. And this is what it looks like in practice. And so there are four things we'll see from this passage this morning. And the first is that faith trusts God's word. That's foundational. Verse 1 begins, now faith is confidence. Now confidence is not a word that immediately springs to mind when talking about faith. Many assume faith has nothing to do with confidence. Mark Twain famously said, Faith is believing something that you really know isn't true. People often think faith is stubbornly shutting your eyes to reality. It's a refusal to face facts. As I was sitting on the chair, I knew the bottom wasn't there. Nor legs nor back, but I just sat ignoring little things like that. 
The world says that's what faith is. Just shutting your eyes to what is obvious. There's no foundation to it. But, but the writer says that's not what faith is. Faith, verse 1, is confidence in what you hope for and assurance about what we do not see. But how can you be confident in what you can't see? Well, because God has made a promise. And faith is responding to God's word. And in the light of that word, we live by faith and not by sight. And that, I think, takes us to the heart of the issue in this first century context. You see, Old Testament religion was by sight, well, at least outwardly. And so, for those early Christians, there was the magnificent temple, priests in splendid robes, offering animal sacrifices that you could see. And those early Christians had abandoned what was visible to follow a Jesus who they couldn't see or touch. Why? Because they believed a message. The message that Jesus was the divine Son of God, who offered his own body on the cross as a once-for-all sacrifice. And through him, they could be forgiven and enter the very presence of God. It was an amazing message. But now, but now, they're under pressure to go back to what is visible, what can be seen. And they were mocked. Where is your God? Where is your religion? We can't see it. And of course, there's nothing to see physically because they are believing a promise of the living God. And the writer says, keep believing the message. That's what faith is. It's a response of trust. There's nothing mystical about it. In fact, we all exercise faith all the time in different ways. For example, every time you go to the supermarket and buy a tin of Heinz baked beans, you're exercising faith. You're believing the message on the tin that claims it contains Heinz beans and not pickled onions. You can't see them. You're trusting. Or every time you go to the station and the timetable says the train is going to leave at 11 o'clock and you arrive at 10.55 and you're waiting on the platform all alone. You can't see the train, but you're exercising faith. So Christians have believed God's message. God's message that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice and through faith in him we're made clean to enter the very presence of God himself in heaven. Christians live by faith and not by sight. And verse 2, that is what the ancients were commended for. These Old Testament men and women who believed the word of God. So for instance, Noah, verse 7, by faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. God spoke and he told Noah he was going to judge the earth by some great flood. Now, Noah couldn't see the flood and there was no rain at that time, but he believed. And how his neighbours must have laughed. There's mad Noah, they'd say, in his pickup truck going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards with all of that material for an ark. An ark? God's going to judge? Nobody believes that nonsense, do they? Don't be silly, Noah. But Noah had faith. He believed God's word. Or Sarah, verse 11, by faith, even Sarah, that's Abraham's wife, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. This goes right back to the time when God spoke to Abraham and said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you by giving you many descendants. And through those descendants, there'll be a great nation. And through that nation, salvation will come to the world. That's the embryonic gospel promise that is finally fulfilled 
in Christ. And at the beginning, it looks impossible because Abraham and Sarah can't have children. And Sarah, well, she's way past the menopause, but she believed God's word and trusted. And sure enough, the miracle happened. And the writer says that's what persevering faith looks like. And so he's saying to these first century Christians, don't go back to the temple and the rituals you can see. Keep persevering with faith in Jesus. Faith trusts God's word. Second, faith looks to God's city because the word of promise is a promise about the future. And that's exhibited very clearly in the life of Abraham. Verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. You can imagine Abraham, can't you, packing his camels with all of his possessions and a neighbour comes along and says, where are you going, Abraham? And he says, I don't know. You don't know? Yes, I don't know. God told me to go. And he said he'd make it clear along the way. And so I'm going. And he went, leaving Ur of the Chaldeans where he enjoyed, it seemed, great wealth. And he headed on a pilgrim, pilgrimage towards a place that hadn't yet been revealed to him. And that's a picture of the Christian life. Christian life is a journey. And when we begin to follow Jesus, none of us know quite where that will lead. So when I started out in banking with Lloyds, it never occurred to me that I could end up as a minister of a church in Kent. And the very thought that I would be doing this, talking to hundreds of people online, well, that was unimaginable. And earlier in the service, we heard from our missionaries in Chad, Bethan and Gareth Shrubsoul. And when Bethan and Gareth started out on the Christian journey, it would never occur, have occurred to them that they might end up with their three children as missionaries overseas in Chad. And for others of us, well, we'll end up doing the kind of things and living in the kind of places that we'd always expected. But nonetheless, the moment we begin to follow Jesus, we are leaving things behind. We're no longer going with the flow. It's a whole change of orientation of our lives. And none of us quite know where that will lead in the days ahead. Verse 9, Abraham arrived in Canaan. He's told it's the promised land, and yet he still lived like a stranger in a foreign land. Abraham, who's been promised this land, we're told, lives in a tent, as does his son Isaac in time and his grandson Jacob. But it didn't worry him, verse 10, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And those Old Testament saints never did reach their true home in this lifetime. Verse 13, they were still living by faith when they died, and they did not receive the things promised. They were foreigners and strangers on earth, yet they didn't look back. Or, verse 15, they would have had the opportunity to return. Just as the Hebrew Christians had the opportunity to return to the temple. But the saints of old did not look back. And even though they hadn't arrived yet, they kept pressing on. Verse 16, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. So God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared a city for them. The Bible, you might say, is a tale of two cities. The first, represented by this world, 
a world and society built as a temple of human achievement for human glory without reference to God. And the second, God's city, the New Jerusalem, Mount Zion as it's described in chapter 12. And one day, says the book of Revelation, this world as we know it will fall and God's new city will come, one whose foundations are absolutely secure and will last forever. And the Bible says we're not made for this present world. This world is not our home. And failure to recognise that will undoubtedly bring huge disappointment in this life. If people live as if this life is all there is, they will never be fulfilled, whatever their achievements. And when failure or suffering comes, if this life is all there is, then they won't cope. Whereas those who know their eyes are fixed on a future city can cope with the ups and downs of life because their goal is beyond. This present world is not their destination. And so it doesn't matter if they only live in a tent. It doesn't matter. And if my fortunes or circumstances change, as they often do, and we've only just got to look at the current situation with the coronavirus to see that that's true for everyone. And whilst that is not easy, if I'm a Christian, it's not the end of the world. Because I recognise the things of this earth, they're temporary and they're not what I'm focusing on ultimately. I'm looking forward to the eternal city that is to come. So faith trusts God's word. Faith looks to God's city. And third, faith lives God's way. Faith is not just an intellectual assent. It's not just a tick the box, I believe in God. It translates into how we live and act. Noah built his ark. Abraham left his homeland. And what about Moses? Verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. What an astonishing decision to make. Moses, you'll probably recall, was born a Hebrew at the time when they were slaves in Egypt. And yet by God's providence, he ended up being adopted and raised by an Egyptian princess. And yet at the crucial time in his young life, he chooses not to be identified with the people of his upbringing, but with the despised slave people of his birth. And what a costly thing that was to do. He turned his back on three things that this world values hugely. Status, verse 24, refusing to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, a member of the royal family. You can't go higher than that, can you? Pleasure, verse 25, rather than enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin, choosing to be ill-treated with the people of God. And, verse 26, prosperity. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. And Egypt was an astonishingly wealthy land. And when these things are dangled in front of us, and often what's dangled is not abandon Christ altogether, but just, just drift a little, that's how it all begins. I wonder, what is the biggest challenge for you right now? Maybe it's status, your position and popularity, how people think of you. Or pleasure, fleeting pleasures, because pleasures don't last, you know that. And there's always regret afterwards. But they're pleasures all the same. Or prosperity, how tempting in this world where we have so much to accumulate 
and to use what we have just to do all the things I want to do and to live the way I want to live rather than to use them as God wants us to. And these are regular challenges. Day after day we're going to have to make choices. Will we live by faith or go with those other things? And it may be a choice about a job or a relationship. And just occasionally we'll face a choice that will determine the whole direction that we will travel. Moses had that kind of moment. And yet amazingly, he was uncompromising, despite the cost, and unafraid. Verse 27. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. He kept going in the life of faith. He was unafraid. Fear determines a lot about how we live our lives. You're with a group of friends and you know what they're doing is wrong. So do you speak out or do you keep quiet and join in? Your decision will be governed by who you fear. Or at work, there's an expectation about how to act in that culture that you know is wrong. And you know if you speak out, then you'll face a derision, or perhaps worse, perhaps there's a bully of a boss who marginalises you because of it. Do I fear them, or do I fear the living God? Moses, we're told, verse 27, didn't fear the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. You see, faith is a question of how you look. Do you look just with a physical eye, where Pharaoh looks very impressive, doesn't he? Or do you look with the eye of faith and see another throne, with the king of kings sitting on it? It's a question of how you look. It's a question of where you look. This world only, or the world to come. Moses, the end of verse 26, was looking ahead, ahead to his reward. You see, living God's way is not foolish because, and here's my final point, faith receives God's reward. Moses was looking ahead to his reward. The whole of chapter 11 gives examples of those who were looking ahead to their rewards, and they weren't foolish. Chapter 10, verse 36. You need to persevere, so when you have done the will of God, you will receive what is promised. The life of faith is worth it. You won't miss out. Chapter 11 underlines that over and over again. However, if you live the life of faith, this world will not commend you. They won't understand you. They'll think on occasions you're utterly mad. Why are you living in that place or taking that job because you want to serve in the local church? Why are you taking your family to another part of the world that's messy and difficult when you could enjoy comfort? because you're committed to telling others about Jesus. Saying no to what everyone else thinks because you believe the Bible. The world will not commend you for the life of faith, but God will. Verse 2. This is what the ancients were commended for. Verse 4. We read, Abel was commended as righteous, Commended by whom? Not the world, by God. The end of verse 5. Enoch, commended as one who pleased God, and without faith it is impossible to please God. Same again at the end of the chapter, verse 39. These were all commended for their faith, 
yet none of them received what had been promised. Some, in fact, suffered terribly. Verse 36 and 35 and onwards, tortured, jeered at, flogged, even put in chains and imprisoned. There are some false teachers who say that if you just have enough faith, then everything in this world will be hunky-dory. You'll have health, wealth and prosperity. And if you haven't got that, it's just because you're not exercising enough faith. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible is very honest. It says if you live a life of faith now, it won't be easy. And all these examples in chapter 11 of lives lived by faith, did you notice they did not receive what was promised in their lifetime? Because, verse 40, God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. All these Old Testament lives focused on the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And through him, as we've seen previously, we can enjoy perfection. In God's sight, if we trusted in Christ, we're perfect. We're able to enter his very presence. We know it by faith in part now, and we'll know it in full when Jesus returns. And then we'll enjoy eternal life in the heavenly city, the glorious new creation. And when that happens, I can tell you this, none of us will be saying, saying, I wish I hadn't lived that life of faith. None of us will be saying, I wish I hadn't persevered. I wish I hadn't made those sacrifices. I wish I'd followed the crowd and gone with the flow to the temples that they worship. No one will be saying that on that day. Because faith receives God's reward. It's not a foolish thing to do. And so, my friends, persevere. Keep living the life of faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for all of these examples from the past. We pray that we might keep in step with them, cheered by their encouragement persevering and living the life of faith, whatever the cost. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen.
so much for being with us this morning. Do have a very good rest of the day. And do join us next week. Uh, next week, as it's the third Sunday, um, we would normally share communion together. And so I'll be, during the service, leading us in a time of communion. So please do um, have some bread uh, and uh, some grape juice or something like that available so you can partake in communion next week. Uh, some closing words from the end of the letter we've been looking at, the end of the letter of Hebrews. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. <music>